What's up, geeks? Today we're talking about 10 training rules, regulations, laws that I break. Now, I think these are 10 generally good ideas. I just don't like them, and I don't feel like I get a lot of value from them, so I don't do them. I must break you. Number one, days off. Now, I think it's a good general training practice or strategy to take one day off at least per week. And I certainly think you can have success on five for three or maybe even two days of training per week. However, I probably take one day off every two or three months. And according to some people, I should be dead. I should be dead. There's just no way I could recover while not taking days off. I usually train seven days per week. I have a three day training cycle and I just rotate through that. So when people ask me, I say, okay, day one legs, day two chest and back, day three shoulders and arms. And they say, oh, so you just do this like, and then take a day off and then repeat, or maybe you do like six days in a row, then take a day off. No, no, I just, I just sort of keep going. And I just have a habit of training. It's it's not a compulsion if I have to take a day off. If the wife is like, hey, you want to go somewhere? No problem at all. I just enjoy training and I don't feel like I need those days off to actually progress. Now, I do think that generally speaking, taking at least one day off per week is a good idea, but is it necessary? Probably not. I mean, necessary is a very, very strong word. Clearly, it's not 100% necessary. You train one or two hours a day, you have 22 to 23 hours to recover. I would say there's no absolute need to have a full day off. If you want to, that's a fine way to set it up. And again, it's a generally good idea, but not 100% needed. Next up, bulking and cutting. One thing I've heard many times are that you're supposed to bulk slowly so that you don't gain excess fat or any fat at all in some cases, right? Main gaining, huh? And then you cut slowly so that you don't lose any muscle. So you might get into like a 200 calorie deficit in order to keep all your muscle and not be super hungry and make it sustainable. I tend to bulk quickly and cut quickly as well. So when I'm bulking, I am in a significant calorie surplus. Now I don't count because I don't count calories anymore, but it's probably close to a thousand calories per day if not more, on a lot of days. And do I put on fat? Yep. Do I care? Not really. Okay, as long as I'm getting stronger and I'm progressing in the gym, I am totally okay with that until around 20% body fat. So if I'm going from 12% upwards, I'm probably gaining two to three kilos per month. Then when I decide to cut, I cut quickly. I try to maximize fat loss while keeping all of the muscle that I gained. I don't see the point in pussyfooting the deficit. If you can stick to a large deficit, I would say that is better in most cases. You don't have to fear muscle loss, especially when you're like 20% body fat going down to 15. Most people can do that very, very quickly without really taking a really long time to diet. Okay, I would rather do it quickly, get it over with, and then go back to bulking. Next up, deloads or resensitization phases. I don't do either of these. I will take one to two weeks off one to two times per year, just if I'm traveling or I'm visiting my wife's hometown or something like that. I'm still training during that time, but it's obviously not in the gym. Maybe if I can find some time, but, but often not. But if I didn't have that, I would just keep training. I have deloaded like once or twice in my life where I'm like, yep, okay, I'm going to go in and just use really, really easy weights. To me, that is a waste of time, okay? I would rather manage fatigue in a more fine-tuned way in real time rather than just taking every fourth or fifth or sixth week as a sort of down week. I think it's a fine way to do things, but I find that being more surgical with fatigue management is better for me. I also haven't really found that I've gotten adaptive resistance, even when training with pretty high volumes, which I'll get into a little bit later. I do think it is potentially a thing, but there are absolutely ways around it that don't involve completely ceasing your training or taking a huge amount of weight off the bar in order to reduce the stimulus so you get more stimulus later. I think for the most part, for me, that is a waste of time. It's a fine way to do things. If it works for other people, it's fine but I have found that it is pretty much useless. Number four, the pump. Now, according to some people, the pump is fantastic. It is amazing. Ah! <laughs> Fucking horrible Arnold impression. 
I get a pump from hypertrophy training, but it's not something that I'm really targeting or trying to optimize or trying to maximize. It is just a byproduct of training hard in the hypertrophy rep ranges that I'm doing, but I'm not doing like blood flow restriction. I'm not doing like drop sets to try to get as much blood into the muscle. I think that is overrated. And while it might be correlated with growth, I don't think it's nearly as causative of, as some people think. And certainly I have not uh, been dissatisfied with my progress by not focusing on the pump. I get a pump, but it is just a byproduct. And I think a power lifter will get minimal pump. A bodybuilder doing bodybuilding style training will get a pretty good pump. Someone trying to maximize their pump is probably going to sacrifice other parameters to the point where the hypertrophy might actually be worse. So I think for most people, the pump is not something that is that important to chase. If it happens, great, but I would not alter your volume or your rest times or exercise selection or anything like that or your rep range in order to try to maximize it. Number five, training to failure. Now I've heard this many times, oh, don't train to failure all the time. Only go to failure on the last set. You need to be really careful with training to failure. It'll impact your recovery. It'll impact your central nervous system. I think this in large part is taking lifts like the squat and the deadlift and applying this mindset to every other lift. That is stupid. So for squat and deadlift, I completely agree. You shouldn't be training to failure all the time and probably not at all. The risk to reward stimulus to fatigue ratio, whatever you want to call it, just is not worth it. But on something like a cable lateral raise or a chest supported row, you really do want to take these to failure most of the time. And on something like hammer curls, I'll take every set to failure, even the first set. Does it impact later performance? At first, yes, but you get used to it. You adapt, okay? I might do the first set 10 reps beyond failure. Genuinely, 10 reps beyond failure, where I do full range of motion for 10 reps, getting as high as possible, and then the next 10 reps are as high as possible, but it's technically beyond technical failure. This is fatiguing, this is difficult, this is challenging, and that's why it fucking grows muscle. And so I pretty much wipe my ass with all this, like, be careful of failure stuff on the correct lifts. You can't do that with squat and deadlift, they will break you. They bite back harder than pretty much any lift. But on these isolation stuff, on machines, on stuff with the strength curve where it's difficult in the contracted position, make failure your default, and I promise you, your results will be better for 90, 95% of people, okay? Not for everyone, but for most people, hell yeah. Number six, full range of motion. Now, I think this is generally a good idea, and most people, when they do partial range of motion, They're doing it in the easy part of the range of motion. So think about the term quarter squat. Are you thinking of someone doing the bottom part of the range of motion? You know, going into, you know, up a little bit, but keeping tension on the muscles? Or are they doing like quarter squats in the very top position and using a shit ton of weight and probably, you know, not getting a lot out of the movement? Probably that second one, right? So I would say if you are using partial range of motion in the difficult part of the range of motion for the difficult you're going to get a lot out of the movement. But if you're trying to avoid the difficult, you're probably not doing much. Here's an example. I've been doing lateral raises where I'm just using this range of motion right here, right? In the, in the top part, because down here, it's like, why? I mean, you're not really doing much anyway. And yeah, you could say, oh, maybe you're getting momentum so you can use more weight to the top part. Um, And I do think that is viable, but I also think it's viable to do partial range of motion and just do the difficult part. Someone asked me today, actually, I was doing cable overhead extensions, and they're like, why don't you pull the cables apart or the rope attachment apart at the end? Well, that's because this is is way more challenging than the rest of the range of motion, and so it would limit the weight used, making this the limiting factor, and I would rather not have this contracted position, whatever the fuck that is, be the limiting factor, I would rather have the failure point be in a more stretched position because that is going to be much better for growth. Number seven, warm-ups. Now, I think it is a generally good rule of thumb to do less warming up. If you look at most people, it's like they do this activation exercise and then this they have to, the upper dorsimus rectumus has to be 
put in place and you have to snap it down and now you can bench, you can probably just go bench, okay? However, I do find that on some movements, I need more warm-up sets than most people would advise or advocate. So you hear a lot of people say like, oh, just do like one or two warm-up sets. For me on squats, I probably need six, seven, eight before I actually feel good. And I actually feel stronger the more warm-ups I do. You hear like, oh, you don't wanna make yourself weak for the working weight. I have not found that to be the case at all. And it's almost like the more I warm up, the stronger I get. So this seems paradoxical, but on some movements, that's just how it works for me. And even if I was fatigued for the top set, who cares? Like I'm not a power lifter. I'm not trying to move the most weight. I'm trying to put stress on the muscle. And you could even argue warming up more is a form of pre-exhaustion. So I think something like pyramid training seems to be falling out of favor. I still enjoy it. I might do a hard set of 20 or, or 15 or 12 before the top heaviest set because eventually I don't really care about that top set. Like it's nice, but for me, that's not what is actually driving progress and adaptations. Next up, volume. Now you hear a lot of the uh, scientific consensus being somewhere in the 10 to 20 range. And I do think that is actually a good starting point for most people. And typically when I'm writing a program, I will be somewhere in that range, assuming they want to develop that muscle group. However, for me, for some areas, I'm way over 20, okay? For the past three months, I've averaged 40 sets for back. Now back is lats, back is traps, back is rhomboids, like the back is complex and often needs more volume because of that. But 40 sets, that's a lot. That's more than most people should do. But through experimentation, that's what I've found actually gives me the best results. And so I'm not saying go do 40 sets per week for your back, okay? That's not what I am saying. I think the 10 to 20 rule is a pretty good one. But if you're at 15, if you're at 18 and your back is not growing and you're doing everything else right, you know, the technique, uh, the proximity to failure, execution, intention, everything like that, exercise selection, you might still be under training your back. Okay, there's going to be a bell curve of people. You might be on this far end along with me where you just might need more volume to grow. For me, for my hamstrings, my uh, MRV, the max recoverable volume, is way, way lower. So it is individual and any kind of scientific estimation is going to be in estimation for the general population and you don't know exactly where you stand until you actually experiment and you might be a little bit off the beaten path so number nine you might think that if i'm doing a lot of work to failure year round with high volumes i must be super super sore all the time right not really okay i barely get sore i'll get a little bit sore sometimes it depends on like if i introduce a new movement uh, or if I, you know, choose a new rep range or something like that, or if I modify my technique. But generally speaking, I don't get that sore. I've gotten lots of comments where it's on a video or Instagram post saying, oh man, you must have been sore for like a week. Oh, how did you walk after this? I got sore for like a little bit for half a day. Like I, I think I'm kind of sore and nothing else. So I think you can adapt to more than you think, right? You can actually adapt to training to the point where you barely get sore at all. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think chasing soreness is often chasing something that is not gonna get you the results that you actually want. If you're constantly changing your program in order to get sore, I would say you are probably misguided. However, I do think that if you're never getting sore at all, that is probably a problem. I will still get a little bit sore because I know how to auto-regulate my volume and my effort to get to that little bit of sore level. But I'm never brutally sore. Sometimes I'm not sore at all, but usually I'm mildly, very slightly sore. And I think that's gonna be where you want to be. If you're always brutally sore, if you're never sore at all, um, I think you're missing the mark in some ways. Number 10, progressive overload. Now hear me out. I used to be very, very much on board with like, you got to get better every single workout, every single week. You got to be adding weight to the bar to drive the adaptations. I think for some people, if you're a little bit more meek or timid, yeah, you need to be really actively driving those adaptations. Otherwise, they're just not going to show up. But if you are naturally more on the higher effort side anyway, and you're training with higher volume, 
you don't necessarily need to drive those adaptations as hard because they are being driven through other pathways. So for me at this point, I'm happy taking the same weight multiple weeks in a row, and that does not bother me in the slightest. Heck, even if I go down in strength slightly, I am totally okay with that. I might reduce my volume or tweak some other parameters to get back on track, but it doesn't bother me mentally at all. If I hit 10 reps with something last week, and I hit 8 or 9 reps this week, doesn't phase me, doesn't bother me, because I know the general trend is still heading in the right direction, and I think that is what is most important. Heck, there are some movements where I've been using the same weight for like a year or two years, and I'm just getting more out of the movement by focusing on quality uh, or technique or tempo or a pause or something like that, and I'm not really fussed with adding weight to the bar, I can still get a lot out of the same weight. I can still milk those gains. So I think generally speaking, these rules are good ones, but realize again, there's this bell curve and you might be on one side of it. Someone might be on the other side of the volume curve where they just can't handle very much volume and they're very sensitive to the training process. That's totally fine. There's nothing inherently good about doing more or less volume. The only thing that has inherent value is progress. And so if I see someone doing lower volume or lower frequency or taking three or four days off per week, as long as they are still making progress and they know themselves and they know that is the right path for them, that doesn't make it better or worse. It's just different. Okay. So realize that these rules are just a middle ground and you could very well be on either side of them. And that's part of training, experimenting and trying to find out what is going to be best for you when it comes to tweaking all of these parameters. Anyway, for more information about that, definitely grab a copy of my book. It goes into full details on how to tweak your training in order to get the most out of your time in the gym. Thank you so much for the support, and I will see you in the next video. Peace. I must buy you.